homeland to India. These monks who have settled in southern India still continue to transmit and preserve their Buddhist monastic heritage. Today, they've been invited to the small farm of old family friends to hear their son's formal request to join their monastery. Their son, named Lobsang, has been encouraged to leave home for a monastic life by his mother and father, who are devout Buddhists and loyal patrons of the monastery. He is also guided by an uncle, a cousin, and an aunt, who were previously ordained into religious life. The father and his daughter lead the monks toward the house where they are greeted by Lobsang and Lobsang's aunt, Anila, who has taken the vows of the Buddhist nun. Before asking the monks to accept Lobsang into the monastery, Lobsang asks his father to make sure that his mother and aunt still go along with his decision to be a monk. Reassured by the whole family's resolve that Lobsang should join the monastery, Lobsang's father makes a formal request to the monks. The senior monk will approve the request, but stress the difficulties and challenges of monastic life. The next day, happy that Lobsang is becoming a monk, but sad to see him leave home, mother and father play scarves over his neck as a blessing for good luck and a safe journey. For centuries, Sera Monastery has been ranked among the greatest scholastic and religious institutions of Tibetan Buddhism. Unique for its emphasis on scholarly training, Sera belongs to the Gelugpa sect, one of four major Tibetan sects. In Tibet, the original Sera Monastery housed over 4,000 men. In India, it contains about 800 men. Lubsang's close family ties to this monastery determined his decision to be ordained here, where his head is carefully shaved to leave only a few strands of hair which will be cut off during the ordination ceremony. The next day, he dons new monastic robes and bows three times out of respect for the abbot and devotion to the Buddha. Following the example set by the Buddha, 
Lobsang's last threads of hair are cut off to symbolize his separation from worldly life. Forty-one prescribed questions determine Lobsang's suitability for monkhood before his new garments are formally given to him. Then he ritualistically takes up the begging bowl for obtaining his daily sustenance. The monks invoke the blessings of the deities and Lobsang's commitment to uphold the ten vows of a novice monk. These vows prohibit killing, stealing, lying, sex, and intoxication. They forbid dancing, singing, wearing jewelry and makeup, sitting on luxurious high seats, eating at improper times, and touching or accepting precious metals. To seal his ordination, Lobsang vows to take refuge in the Three Jewels. Lastly, Lobsang receives the blessings of the abbot as he enters a lifelong career with his new monastic family. At dawn, the sound of the gong and the conch shell awaken the monks of Sarah Monastery. They arise to contemplate and meditate the scriptural teachings on perfect wisdom and compassion. Perfect wisdom is the direct insight that all phenomena exist interdependently, empty of an absolute mode of existence. Perfect compassion is the altruistic aim to attain enlightenment in order to alleviate the suffering and bring happiness to all creatures. Before the sun rises, a select group of monks perform special rituals of rededication to altruistic purposes. They invoke the benevolence and protection of guardian deities. Their chants, gestures, and musical instruments have secret symbolic significance. By using them in their rituals, the monks hope to transform their selfish pursuit of worldly pleasures into the altruistic pursuit of universal peace and happiness. Early morning prayers for the other monks are led by a monk with a specially trained voice. He's called the Umze. The master of discipline, called Gege, monitors the behavior of young monks. The large assembly hall is often the setting for early morning meals, where one of the duties of novice monks is to fetch tea from the kitchen. Thick salt-buttered tea combined with bread make up a typical breakfast. Communal meals are prepared in a large kitchen where four men are required just to knead huge quantities of bread dough. Tibetan tea, a constant drink of many monks, is prepared in wooden churns. The early morning monastic routine always calls for the cleaning of rooms and grounds. as other monks are aided by villagers in constructing new buildings. Monks alternate their studies with manual labor, such as the building of this new library and study center, where even the 70-year-old abbot 
lends his hand. In India, these monks must farm to survive. But in Tibet, their daily sustenance was provided by local farmers and villagers. Activities of a more religious orientation find artists mixing pigments from stones and plants for paintings called tankas, which often depict manifestations of Buddha and the lives of famous Buddhist teachers. Ritualistic offerings called tormas are carefully sculpted from flower dough. These offerings are daily made during major ceremonies. Colorfully painted, they are placed on altars in front of the statues of Buddha. As they have been for a thousand years, wooden blocks are hand engraved with letters for printing the sacred Buddhist scriptures. The scriptures contain hundreds of volumes of the words of the Buddha and scholarly interpretations of these words by Indian and Tibetan religious scholars. The wood blocks are manually printed on thick, durable wood pulp paper. The words of the Buddha are read aloud in the temple several times a year. Translated from Indian Sanskrit manuscripts, they number tens of thousands of pages. In Tibet, monasteries like Sera have developed a 20-year-long curriculum for learning and interpreting the Buddha's words. Graduates are honored with a degree known as Geshe. New monks like Lobsang begin by learning to read and write Tibetan, a distinctive polysyllabic language containing 34 vowels and consonants. Then they begin a lifetime process of memorizing the fundamental scriptures. The ability to remember scriptural lines is tested several times a year by the abbot. Many monks have memorized thousands of pages of scriptures. The memorized material, which serves as a mental outline for all monastic subjects, is explained in daily class lectures. The main subjects include logic, epistemology, ontology, metaphysics, cosmology, and ethics. Each student's understanding is tested in class and again in lively debates with classmates. In daily debates, one student stands and loudly claps his hands as he fires questions and another answers while their classmates mentally prepare themselves for their own turns at debate. Progressive stages of memorization, classwork, and debate are designed to condition their minds systematically to meditate the ultimate Buddhist truth and attain the enlightenment of a Buddha. Therefore, they memorize the rules of formal logic and debate. The first lessons are explained by their teacher in class. The argument of the boy standing will explore the relationship obtaining 
between a general category, color, and a particular object whose color is white. Buddhist logic, in its most sophisticated forms, is often compared to Aristotelian logic. <laughs> After several years of training in elementary logic and debate, teenage monks memorize the rules of epistemology so they can begin to analyze cognitive processes. Studies in logic and epistemology are combined with learning the definitions of the three Buddhist jewels in which Buddhists everywhere take final refuge. Like a doctor, the Buddha is believed to have prescribed medicinal teachings to be dispensed through his nurse-like congregation to eliminate the causes and miseries of life and death. The Buddha's medicinal teachings are generally summarized by his Four Noble Truths, the truth that we are suffering, the truth describing the causes of our suffering, the truth that in Nirvana there is cessation from suffering, the truth that the path away from suffering is shown by the Buddha. In debate, the monks review scriptural sources on the Four Noble Truths, which tell why all creatures are bound to suffer endless cycles of life and death, and reveal the path which emancipates one from suffering. <laughs> The middle path courses between the extremes of intellectual absolutism and nihilism. People and things are thought to exist conventionally as interdependent phenomena, yet they are empty of an absolute mode of being. The middle path also courses between extremes of hedonism and asceticism. Living an extremely hedonistic life only obscures life's true miseries of birth, 
aging, sickness, and death. Living an extremely ascetic life destroys mental and physical health needed for spiritual endeavors. The wisdom of the middle path is useless without a compassionate method for freeing others from suffering. Flying together, the wings of wisdom and compassion will carry all beings over the ocean of misery to the shores of freedom. To cultivate the wings of wisdom and compassion, these monks have spent nearly 20 years at Sera Monastery. They are already accomplished teachers of younger monks and the people in farms and villages. Still, they cherish these moments with their oldest and wisest teacher, who offers his methods for compassionately applying wisdom in the world. Symbolizing the compassionate method is the debater's right hand. Symbolizing wisdom is his left. The clapping of the right and left hand symbolizes the joining of wisdom and compassion. Both the purpose and the content of the debate are monitored by the abbot. The abbot also presides over spirited annual debates where each member of each class must test and be tested by fellow classmates. A successful performance enables them to graduate on to higher levels of learning. After the successful completion of this 20-year curriculum, 